So first up we have uh, Fiona Carswell from Landcare Research who is our challenge host. Uh, Fiona has a background in botany and plant ecology and she's had a variety of leadership roles within Landcare Research most recently as our chief scientist. Uh, she's going to talk to us about growing the pie, how the bioheritage challenge is shaping New Zealand's bioheritage research. Inga mana, inga reo, inga haue fa, ira rangatirama, tina kaito, tina kaito, tina kaito katoa. Thank you very much for being here. I'm pressed to see so many people here at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and today, what I'm going to talk about is the power of the Bioheritage Science Challenge to shape New Zealand's biodiversity and biosecurity research. Now, probably everybody here knows the aims of the challenge, and yesterday will have been a good refresher of those. The critical points are that it's working and conservation lands, that we need to know what species we have, and we need science-based solutions to combat the threats. Aims of the challenge are very strongly aligned with those of Predator Free 2050. In fact, the challenge is writing science strategy for Predator Free 2050. <clears throat> the ambitious goal for that project is the eradication of possums, rats and stoats by the date. And um, today you'll hear a lot about Predator Free 2050 initiatives, and there will also be a bit of a focus on what genomics may be able to offer that breakthrough, breakthrough science solution. But why be Predator Free? What's the point? <clears throat> Four main aims here removing the major threats to our native wildlife, enhancing economic returns from primary industries, and creating new opportunities through tourism and regional development, and the very important issue of intergenerational equity. If we take a quick look at economic benefits for primary industries, we spend a lot of money globally on rat control every year, at least US $500 million. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates that rodents destroy or contaminate 20% of human food per annum. <clears throat> Possums is something that other countries don't tend to get so excited about, but for us, they're a big issue, and we've estimated that even for one region alone, for Hawke's Bay, the economic benefits just through TB reduction is 380 million over 30 years, with considerable additional benefits to primary industries through non-TB benefits. <clears throat> but this is what I really want to focus on today. Removing the major threats to our native wildlife. What do we mean? What do we mean by native wildlife? I suggest this is really what we mean. I think we mostly mean birds, because New Zealanders are pretty keen on birds. When we look at all those places in Aotearoa where we have gone to the effort of making safe havens for threatened species, 75% of the time we've translocated birds there. Now, it seems that that is in alignment with what New Zealanders can relate to. In a completely non-scientific study of New Zealand websites, I found that there were a lot more relating to birds than non-birds. Uh, Kiwi, of course, is a completely unfair advantage because it's the national bird, and it does turn up on websites as incongruous as bacon, shoe polish. But even um, expatriate New Zealanders, such as the late John Clark, have had a bit of a thing for birds. John was apparently photographing birds in the Grampian Mountains at the time of his death. <clears throat> However, 
removing predation doesn't guarantee bird recovery. <clears throat> you heard from Jan's talk yesterday that uh, removal or reduction of predation is necessary to ensure bird survival, but <clears throat> once that's taken care of, other processes become the next most limiting steps there. <clears throat> If we don't reduce the predation, small populations become extremely vulnerable to random or stochastic events. You see the uh, recent Kaikoura earthquake has had a significant effect on inland nesting sites of Hutton Shearwater. Uh, the Huya even was surely pushed to extinction by the hat trade using the tail feathers, but surely it was predation that allowed the numbers to get low enough for that to happen. <clears throat> Yesterday, Jan posed that uh, genetic resilience and habitat come into play once predation is controlled. So I want to ask how we collectively are preparing for that whole suite of tools and measures that are required to ensure uh, bird populated Aotearoa in the future. And this is where the challenge is so important because it can align the whole research community. What's the first way that the challenge can do that? Through aligning resource. Now this is a path diagram showing funding aligned to the challenge. Last financial year there were $58 million worth of aligned research dollars to this challenge. On the left you can see the funders you can see where that funding has flowed through the system to the challenge parties on the right hand side. Of that 58 million, 30 million was aligned from CRIs, 18 from universities, and 10 from central government, uh, most notably Department of Conservation and Ministry for Primary Industries. Maybe it's not surprising as challenge hosts that Landcare Research has aligned the most at $14.5 million. So why would Landcare Research do that? It's because our crazy and ambitious vision is this. Ki matamoto te tupuatane a rongo a haumia tikitike. Let it be that the land and all its fruits may flourish. Probably most people here are familiar with Tane Mahuta, but our aspiration is that the realms of Tane Mahuta, the forests, Rongomatane, cultivated foods, and Homia Tikitiki, non-cultivated foods, are all vibrant and flourishing. Earlier this year, the challenge listed priorities that were essential for it to achieve its mission. Here I've picked out just the ones that relate to a predator-free 2050, but the critical point about these priorities is that the challenge stated it is unable to fund all the research required to achieve these priorities. They cover the restoration of threatened species and ecosystems, um, additional effort in the elimination or control of predators, how to scale that up to whole landscapes, and then very importantly, how do we know that we've made any difference? How do we measure the difference we've made? And how do we know that we are using the most cost-effective technologies to get there? This is where we come back to birds. So birds, I think, very much qualify as a threatened species. They live in ecosystems. 77 of our bird species are threatened, and we know that when we take out that predation there, that they become entirely dependent on ecosystems. Occupancy of our deep endemic bird species, such as uh, kiwi, kaka, whitehead, very strongly correlated with indigenous forest cover. It's good that Jan and I are saying the same things about what the critical factors are there. Strong genes, big population sizes that are a function of habitat. 
We actually don't know really well whether you can substitute a large total habitat area for lots of little connected bits. That is something that's still a live debate. <clears throat> so let's take a quick look at Kiwi. As we heard yesterday, endemic to the level of order, so very special globally. The figure on the left shows the intensity of management of the Kiwi taxa. Uh, X-axis is the square root of population size, Y-axis is the percent of birds managed. So what that's telling us is that we more intensively manage the things we don't have many of. And the figure on the right suggests that those things with less intensive management continue to decline in number. So we want to be mindful of this and not let them go to that place where they can't have strong genetics to ensure their viability indefinitely. <clears throat> so we have developed a method for looking at Kiwi populations and genetics. It's non-invasive, so it recovers DNA from feathers and scat. We find we can't recover as much DNA as you might get from some of the other animals that this method has been used for, but it is still enough for population genetic analysis. <clears throat> Enter the Haast Tokweka. This is one of our most rare taxa. There are only 400 birds left from the um, Haast region. And the name, for those of you who don't know, is from Kaitahu dialect, means weka with walking stick, and uh, <clears throat> they are an alpine kiwi. This non-invasive technique has allowed us to look at both mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. The haplotype network down the bottom uh, <clears throat> is from the mitochondrial DNA. Up the top you see the structure analysis from the nuclear genetic marker panels. The, um, <clears throat> there has been a population found recently in Upper Arafata, which is geographically separated from the others. And the Department of Conservation was interested in, is there a genetic divergence there? Both of these figures are showing that those Upper Arafata birds, the very steep part of that valley there, appear to be genetically different. So that's what the, all that orange panel is up here. That is those ones from the upper Arafata. So the question is, is this a threat or an opportunity? We would argue that there is an opportunity there for the provenance as a whole with maybe a very little local pollution. <laughs> So back to those challenge priorities. <clears throat> there are the next set of priorities relate to uh, predator control. Predator Free 2050 is promising a breakthrough science solution for one predator by 2025. So what do we need? We need interim tools, therefore. We need tools for multiple predators. We need tools um, <clears throat> for new incursions and to get to those recalcitrant individuals. So Landcare Research has put quite a lot of effort into the um, interim tools. We are investigating optimal layout of traps, wireless monitoring of traps, whether it's more cost effective to use multi-capture multi or the cheaper single capture technology how to improve capture efficiency, novel laws, how humane are any of these technologies, and how to avoid non-target species, especially those birds that we are trying to protect in this process. <clears throat> Challenge also asks how do we scale up to whole landscapes, and this is where the Cape to City project comes in. <clears throat> Cape to City is a multi-agency collaboration between Department of Conservation, Hawke's Bay Regional Council, Cape Sanctuary, Aotearoa Foundation, Mangaharuru Tangitu Trust and Landcare Research. It's not the largest predator control operation at 26,000 hectares. Osprey operations can be 90,000. Recent Battle for Our Birds program was 84. 
thousand hectares, but it is very unusual in that it's primarily farmland and it's right next to a major urban centre. There are multiple pests involved. It can't work without citizens and landowners participating. It's not getting off the ground without that. It needs to be cheap. And at the end of all of this effort, there's no fence. So incursions are just a fact of life that are going to need to be managed indefinitely. You'll hear more about Cape to City today from other speakers, so I'm just going to focus on the research. And the first thing we noticed when we looked at a sister project at um, Poteria Otani was that not all predator traps are equal. Some catch more. When we took that information and we looked at camera trapping, we could model predator movements and we designed a web-based app for operations staff to simulate best placements for traps and how often to check them so that they could maximise uh, network efficiency whilst minimising costs. The figure on the right is the simulated trap placements in the Cape to City project. Next thing we asked was, what happens if not all the landowners want to participate? How will that affect the effectiveness of the program overall? So we looked at four scenarios, the status quo, which is actually most landowners participating. We asked, what happens if the large farms opt out? They're the uh, land holdings of more than 800 hectares. What happens if the lifestyle blocks opt out? They're the ones of less than 25 hectares. And then what happens, can you compensate for opting out by reallocating traps to neighbouring properties? We, monitor, we modelled predator abundance over six years, and this figure here shows feral cat abundance, percentage of landholders participating along the x-axis. There are the four panels there for each of the scenarios. This is the critical one here. Large land holdings, yes it matters. You don't get as many um, <clears throat> cats trapped if big land blocks opt out. Lifestyle blocks don't make very much difference at all. The good news is in the fourth scenario you can compensate for non-participation by reallocating traps onto the um, neighbouring properties there. Back to those challenge priorities. How do we know whether we're making a difference for biodiversity? What are the best regimes to choose to be cost effective and to be able to sustain these low levels of predators? This figure shows all the sanctuaries in New Zealand. And we have compiled a database for those places where biodiversity monitoring has occurred, and we've collated that with the regimes that are giving those biodiversity outcomes. We have over 780,000 records from these places, and that includes data on 438 different species. First of these analysis, been led by Andrea actually, and it's on uh, possum control regimes. The, this was a meta-analysis using a Bayesian hierarchical method. And if we come back to my study species here, we find that birds increased population abundance with possum control and increased nesting success. What about those little things, the things we can't see? There's actually quite a lot of work on these large bodied invertebrates and we know that land snails and wetter do show remarkable recovery following predator control. We don't know much about other things, trophic cascades, altered ecosystem processes and functions. This is a beautiful picture from Alexi Drummond's paper in GigaScience which just gives a snapshot of invertebrate diversity on the forest floor at Hauturu. <clears throat> now, we know that rats eat invertebrates that are bigger than five mils inside. We know that mice eat invertebrates that are bigger than two mils inside. So it stands to reason that if we took out these 
rodents, you would have a whole lot more diversity there. But you know what? We don't measure this. <clears throat> and that's because it's very difficult, it's very time consuming, and therefore it's very expensive. So we need new techniques if we're going to scale up this level of biodiversity monitoring. This is where environmental DNA or eDNA could be extremely helpful. Environmental DNA is simply DNA extracted from an environmental sample. Therefore, it has trace DNA from hair or feces that have been left behind. And it's also that undifferentiated mass of soil stuff. So invertebrates, fungi, bacteria. The power of eDNA is that a single sample can give you information on all these taxa at once. It's potentially extremely cost effective. However, it's still in development for this purpose. And the question is, can it actually detect change? So, we have been running a, just a little pilot study in the Cape to City region and looking at can we use eDNA to pick up differences uh, with and without predator control. We uh, have found that this is currently our rate limiting step because so little of New Zealand's invertebrate diversity is described and even less is barcoded. But we're at the stage now where the technology is accessible and cheap enough that this should be resolvable in the not very distant future. Finally, just want to uh, place the whole predator-free debate into its appropriate socio-ecological context because these Big things to solve all take place within the human ecosystem. <clears throat> so as researchers, how, how much are we talking with people from Aotearoa New Zealand about predator-free goals, whether it's a good idea, how will we get there? Very important to be aware what trade-offs are going to be socially acceptable. We are proposing to kill one group of species in favour of um, preserving another group of species, what technologies are going to be acceptable? In the past, 1080 hasn't been very widespread in its acceptance. Are we setting ourselves up for another of those debates? No doubt that people are going to need to participate directly to have any hope of us achieving this. And the question for us as a research community is how well aligned are we? Lanky Research as hosts of the challenge are really excited by the power of the challenge to bring this community together to try and solve this stuff collectively. We've certainly found ourselves in new collaborations with organisations that we would have formerly been competing with. So we, we are really happy with how the challenge has started off and we're very excited about the fruits that are still to be born. Yeah. So, just want to thank the Department of Conservation for that work they do in the backcountry, uh, for working with us on experiments, and actually probably all of us to be grateful for all the work they're doing front of house. They're actually managing the biggest set of tourism infrastructure this country has. Uh, Lanky Research, lots of people to thank there, but especially want to thank uh, bird expert extraordinaire, John Innes. Thanks, John. <laughs> and finally, I get a word from the sponsor, and that is, please enter our competition. There's Karen Scott up the back there. She's got a poster next to her. You need to stand in front of this, pose for a selfie, and upload your selfie to any social media channel. Please remember those hashtags BlitzMe and Crazy Ambitious. And then you get to nominate a not-for-profit of your choice. Could be a school, could be a marae, could it be another community group. The winner will have a team of taxonomists come to their neighbourhood and help that community to discover what unique and special treasures it has 
in its own backyard. Andrea is going to announce the competition tomorrow, so please do get posting any questions to Karen at the back of the room. <clears throat> Tutato Finua, more Apopo Nareira Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Kato. Um, thanks, Fiona. We've got time for one quick question. Yes, we will be. That work from. Sorry, yes. The question was will we be publishing new best practices for trap placement or um, methodologies for trap effectiveness? And that Cape to City work has been published by. Um, <clears throat> which paper is that? That's the Al Glenn paper. And so that's out, but there are new sets of these coming all the time and there will be new analyses coming as well from the meta-analyses where we can compare all the projects together and pull out the best methods from all of those, especially when it comes to multi-predator control, which of course is much more difficult. Okay, thank you. Thanks.